And uh, thank you to Danny and Rebecca for two very informative talks. Um, I'm probably just going to go into a little bit more detail on a number of things they've already discussed um, and hopefully give you a bit more of a sort of legal perspective on them. Um, so what I then thought I'd uh, start off with is just letting you know about the current regime, um, which is under something called the Data Protection Act. Um, then I was just going to go into the new GDPR, how is it different, what happens if you don't comply, why does it matter, um, and how do you ensure compliance. So currently, um, it's all pretty chilled actually, under the uh, Data Protection Act. Um, register, if you're a data controller, register with the Information Commissioner's Officer. Um, that's kind of, I think it's £35 per annum on that website there. Um, use your terms and conditions, for example, on your website to ensure you tell visitors to that website um, exactly what you're doing with their data. Um, if you're sending marketing emails to uh, those visiting your website, uh, ensure you get their express consent before you do. Um, and on any emails that you send them at all, make sure you include an unsubscribe button. So at the moment, pretty clear, um, a few more complexities, but kind of do that and you won't go far wrong. Um, so yeah, essentially at the moment, um, no universally applicable law requiring notification of breaches, minimal sanctions, um, Organisations are thinking more, how do we avoid stigma, damage to our reputation, um, where there's a data breach rather than about individuals. Um, and sadly, for organisations, good for individuals, uh, GDPR is going to fundamentally change that. Um, so what have we got at the moment? Well, GDPR comes into force 25th of May this year. Um, and there are lots of horror stories. So you've probably heard already that non-compliance can lead to fines of really the greater of 20 million euros or 4% of your group's global turnover. Um, what does this mean? Well, reactions so far clients I've come across, people I've spoken to, to use a few football analogies, um, Range from, you know, there's Arsenal looking a little bit perplexed at Arsenal's continued failure to, um, to win the Premier League. Um, Antonio Conte, he's uh, Barcelona, just not them keeping, keeping them away at night, but awake at night. Through to sheer terror, the kind of Janet Lee in uh, Psycho there. Now, actually, good news is, it's really not that bad. Um, yeah, it comes into force on 25th of May. There's all the various detail, including the EU regulation, EU directive that it's, uh, that it's implementing. Um, but the main thing about it is that it is a complete rethink. It's now thinking more about, let's have some protection for individuals. Let's, let's enable individuals to have a bit more control over how, how the data is used. And let's make organizations accountable. Um, rather than what is, what is typically the case at the moment of organizations you know, downloading from the internet or, or, or paying lawyers for precedence for data processing agreements and, and all that kind of stuff, sticking it on the shelf and, and ticking a box. This is, as we've said before, it's data protection by design. It's encouraging uh, organizations to put in place proper processes to train individuals within that organization to think about their use of data, um, to, to have that accountability if something goes wrong and you know, there hasn't really been an attempt beforehand of an organization to put into, into place a structure that's going to negate the, the, the possibility of that happening. Um, as we talk, we've also touched on before, it applies to companies now outside the EU. What's relevant here are the individuals whose data is being processed inside the EU. So, for example, 
Um, if a company in America, not based here, um, is their website is accessed by individuals in the EU, they are going to be bound by the new GDPR, so they need to be aware of it. Um, just touching on Brexit there, governments basically confirmed decision to leave the EU is not going to affect the commencement of GDPR, and if, when, whatever, we finally become not part of the European Union anymore, um, most experts really cannot foresee uh, any great changes back to a, to a kind of more relaxed regime. So, dealing with the basics, as we've said, GDPR gives individuals more rights and protections regarding how their personal data is processed, used, and shared between organizations. We are talking data protection by design, not just um, organizations having to have in place policies, written policies, but actually be, to be able to say, right, here's the mechanism we're using from beginning to end uh, that we've really thought about to make sure individuals' data is protected. So just dealing with that a little bit more. Um, accountability and processes. Um, not just principles being put in place, but GDPR requires you to show how you comply with those principles. Um, from the begin very beginning, not just making decisions, but documenting the decisions that you make about the use of an individual's personal data. So what's the philosophy behind it? Well, you'll, you'll probably hear at the moment, you're, you know, what are we in? We're in towards the end of February. Um, May's coming pretty quickly. Um, from an organizational point of view, look upon this as a good housekeeping opportunity. The philosophy of GDPR is, if you don't need the data, don't keep it. Um, think about what data your company actually needs. Um, do a data audit to determine um, what data you've got um, within your organization, what departments have what data, does every single department need every single piece of data, or can you, as you're really obliged to do, silo it so that you know, only departments that need particular pieces of data, personal data, have access to it. Um, yeah, so basically, if you don't need it, get rid of it. Um, just dealing with the slides a bit. There we go. Um, so what is personal data under the GDPR? Well, as we've touched on before, any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. So this word identifiable is, is absolutely key. Um, personal data now includes online identifiers. So these would include IP addresses, mobile device IDs. Basically, if an individual can be traced through specific information, um, then that in itself, that information itself, would, would be classified as personal data. Um, relevance of pool size and context. So an assessment of whether something's personal data may depend upon really what the ball size is and who it's being distributed to. So using the example of uh, data that describes us, for example, the tall man with the Labrador who lives at number 26. Now, if that information is held by a national organization miles away from where that individual lives, um, it's pulled with thousands of other names and addresses, um, that quite probably isn't going to be personal data because nobody will be able to work out what they're talking about. Um, if that same information is, for example, held on a server by a local residence association, um, it'll be like, yeah, well, 26, tall bloke, yeah, he definitely lives in that road, I think I know who he is. So 
that indeed at that point is far more likely to be personal data that the Data Protection Act applies to. Accountability. So, as we've said, requires you to comply to, to confirm how you comply with principles, document decisions you take about a processing activity. And just touching on something somebody said before, entities which monitor data subjects or process personal data on a large scale are going to need to employ a data protection officer. They need to be a data protection expert and advise on all matters relating to data protection law. Now the key is here, they have to have a complete sort of veto and overriding decision making power in the organization on, uh, for example, reporting data breaches. So, for example, if the CEO is going, we've had this data breach, but it's going to be so bad for our reputation if this goes out, the data protection officer totally entitled and obliged to say, sorry mate, don't care, we've got to report this one. Um, in sort of smaller organizations where you don't need a data protection officer, you know you're not processing data on a large scale, it's obviously still a very good idea to have a central point of contact uh, that oversees all your data protection activity and, and makes decisions. It's just efficient to do so. So, we've dealt with uh, what personal data is, the sort of principle of accountability. Just moving on now to the, the matter of what consent means. Free, unbundled, and ambiguous uh, articles 4 and 6 of the GDPR say. Um, what does that mean? Well, it's pretty clear really. It means not hiding it in the, not hiding a sort of request for consent in the small print of your terms and conditions, and more importantly being very, very clear on the purpose for which the consent is being sought. So you can't sort of say these days, yeah, we're going to run um, process your personal data, everyone up for that? Um, that's not going to work. Uh, you have to say, well, this is what we're going to process the personal data for, this is in line with um, really our contractual obligations to you, for example, or um, we're going to, we, we'd like to give this data to a third party for this specific purpose that's going to help you. Um, and an individual essentially can, uh, you know, unless it's absolutely necessary for performance of a, of, of a contractual obligation, the individual may well contract out of, may well just go, well, no, I'm, I'm not up for you supplying my data to a, to a third party, actually. Um, and indeed, even within your own organization, um, employees, you know, at the moment in employment contracts, you have a provision that says, guys, you're kind of giving your life away, and we can do whatever we want with your data as your employer. We can look at whatever you're doing no longer. So apart from the sort of very, very basic processing, um, employees now have to, will have to sign into a separate privacy statement uh, which says, yeah, actually, I'm up for my data being processed or looked at in this way, but I'm not up for this, um, and I'm not going to give you, my employer, consent to do that. Um, going back to the principle, very, very important here, of, of stopping unnecessary storage. If you don't need it anymore, um, you know, get rid of it. And that's a process that uh, you can definitely start before the GDPR comes in. So you've got a few months now uh, to consider that. Um, that key point that I talked about, which is um, you know, not just getting consent for data processing, but consent for the specific purpose that you're using it for. So you might have, for example, consent from an individual to process their data for purposes directly connected with performance of the contract um, that, you're, that you're carrying out for them. Um, if that consent changes, if, for example, you think, right, I want to send out a marketing newsletter, 
or actually could be useful to transfer this data to a new department in our organization to offer them a new kind of service, that is a point where you would need to get fresh consent from that individual. It's not just a blanket, right, this guy said yes, we can use his data for whatever we want. Storage location, so that's another, another big one. So GDPR imposes restrictions on the transfer of personal data outside the European Union. Um, so really, default position, don't store it in countries outside the European Economic Area. Um, however, there are exceptions to that. The European Commission has said and has uh, made what's called adequacy findings in respect of the storage of data outside uh, the European Economic Area. Um, that is generally based on things such as uh, a country having really solid legislation and commitment towards data protection. Um, it can also be given in respect of organizations, even in a country that, that, that wouldn't be given an adequacy finding. Um, organizations that, for example, have really strong policies, procedures in place, they train all their employees and staff, uh, they've got their data breach policies organized, there may well be an adequacy finding in respect of that organization, and therefore you might be able to store your data with that organization outside the European Union on that basis. Um, however, adequacy findings are an ongoing uh, monitoring exercise by the EU, so they can change. So always look at the, uh, the updated guidance there. Even within the EU, you know, don't just, for example, go, oh yeah, we've got some amazing, we've got an amazing coding team in Eastern Europe, for example. Probably true, but it's also important for your own protection to go, okay, well, if we have got that, let's make sure we have really good data processing, data transfer agreements in place with, for example, this subsidiary that's based in Romania, Lithuania, for example. Um, make sure we've trained local employees on what their obligations are, how to deal with data breach, etc. Um, because although it won't be a breach, obviously, by just transferring the data to those places, if you've got a load of untrained people who don't know what they're doing, uh, the chances are, you know, of them um, involving you in a breach that you will be responsible for are fairly high. Um, moving on to rights of the data subject themselves, so we'll talk briefly about subject access requests. At the moment, um, businesses now must provide a copy of the personal data they're, they're processing or controlling uh, to an individual that requests upon the payment of up to £10. Now, believe it or not, the payment of £10 seems to be a massive disincentive on people to push through with their requests. So, organisations, you know, it's not really a massive administrative burden for them at the moment. There's now going to be no charge for that, uh, for that request. Um, and currently you've got 40 uh, days to respond, now you've got less than a month. So, ouch, it's, um, businesses are bracing themselves for a lot more of these. Worth knowing that, you know, there are sort of ways around it. If you hold a large amount of data on somebody, um, you can go back on this subject access request and say, well, can you just specify the information or processing activities to which the request relates in a little more detail? Um, really, really hone down what you're looking for. Um, you can refuse a request or charge for a request where, you know, frankly, it's, it's excessive. Um, as we've already said, you can extend the period of compliance, I think, for a further two months where requests are complex or numerous as well. So that can give a bit of breathing space, but essentially something you've got to consider. How are you going to handle these new requests within the new timescales to avoid making it too onerous and time consuming? Um, the right to be forgotten. So, GDPR now provides basically an individual 
if a contract is ended, for example, an individual can just should be able to write to an organization under GDPR and say, can you just get rid of all my data? Um, I don't really want you holding anything on me. I don't want you sending me any more marketing emails. Just stop bugging me. Um, and so, for example, this is going to be quite, quite difficult, again, for an organization to implement. And I think what you've got to think about here is actually really good IT um, to enable this process to be, again, a little less onerous. Now the real fun and games. Data breach. So what's the current situation on data breach? Well, it's pretty chilled, actually. Um, so I've come across a number of organizations who have been contacted, for example, by the Metropolitan Police, going, I don't know if you knew this, but we've been on the dark web of late, and um, there's a lot of credit card information that sort of seems to come from your users just floating around for sale. Um, wondered if we should have a little chat. Um, and from my experience to date, the, 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 sort of, the focus of the response has been a sort of, oh shit, this is bad for our PR, let's get PR involved, let's get our lawyers involved just to deal with the police. And the police's pro sort of, you know, approach has been, well, let's catch the criminals. Um, not many people actually have thought about the individual with his personal data has been breached. So, I'd imagine all of you at some point have probably received an email from a big organization that says, hey, we're just getting in touch, um, no big deal or anything, but just uh, routinely, maybe you might want to think about changing your password. Um, yeah, absolute giveaway, oh shit, had a data hack. Um, we're not really going to tell you that, but uh, we don't really have to report it. Um, police have probably told us not to because they're trying to catch the criminals. Um, but do it anyway, otherwise your personal data might be at risk. That's essentially what that's saying. All change now, as we've said, not later than 72 hours after becoming aware of a breach, you've got to notify the ICO, Supervisory Authority, ICO in this country. Um, second bit really important, if there's a high risk to the rights and freedoms of individuals, you've got to also notify the affected individuals without undue delay. Um, and both to the ICO and to the individuals, that's going to have to be pretty specific. What the data is, how you found that it's been breached, um, what the potential damage is likely to be, and what you're going to do to try and solve the problem. So just giving a few examples of that. Um, so what we're talking about here, yeah, lost or stolen devices that are not properly encrypted or passworded. Got to report that. Emails sent to incorrect addresses in error. Potential, if they contain sort of quite sensitive information, might have to do that as well. Um, another common classic, emails sent to a huge marketing group, forgot to put them in BCC. So they're all there, everyone can see everyone that you're sending this email to. Um, and also be aware of the continuing rise of cybercrime. So for example, um, your IT really better be up to date. Phishing with a PH is pretty common these days. Um, basically, if your system gets hacked without you even knowing it, um, an individual that subscribes to a service that you offer might get an invoice Actually, what's happened is that invoice has been, um, has been stopped before it's uh, on its way from you to your client. The bank account details have been changed and then it's been sent on. And obviously the client pays into the bank account that, uh, that uh, the details have been changed to. Um, that, under GDPR, data breach, your fault, uh, need to deal with it. So again, Establish a breach management procedure to identify, escalate, report if necessary, manage data breaches efficiently. Yeah. So what happens if you don't comply? Well, a lot of people here are probably too young to remember the year 2000, but basically what was going to happen on, um, you know, the moment the clock struck midnight, New Year's Eve 1999, um, planes were going to fall out of the sky, buildings were going to explode, 
um, everyone in hospitals was going to die, it was just going to be a disaster. And lawyers were loving this because they just um, were, were charging fortunes for people to put in place policies um, that said, hey, not my fault if, if all that happened. Um, this isn't it. This isn't the same thing. You can't stick your head in the sand on this one. Um, there is a lot of hysteria, but this really isn't an idle threat. Um, you will be found out. Supervisory authorities, Article 58, GDPR, enjoy wide investigative and corrective powers. Uh, On-site data protection audits, power to issue public warnings, reprimands, orders to carry out specific remediation activities. This, this is big and it's going to go beyond the 25th of May. So really, really start organizing your compliance now. Obviously, what we were talking about before, that sort of 20 million euro fine, etc. Generally, don't worry about that unless you're a really bad person. You know, if you've had massive breaches, you've deliberately not notified, you've been totally reckless on your compliance, um, loads of people have suffered, then understandably, uh, as an organisation, you can expect a pretty big fine. So, there are some, some sort of practicalities here that you can, that you can use to, to deal with the issues. So, create awareness as an organisation among your relevant group heads and decision makers that this is here, this is what it means, this is what we need to do about it. We need to put in place a cross-organisational, a sort of cross um, transparent, data protection by design system so that everyone knows their jobs, everyone knows what happens if there's a data breach, people know what happens if there's a subject access request, all that stuff, there's got to be a system that's ongoing to deal with it. Um, as we've said, data audit, really good idea, not just at the beginning but on an ongoing basis. Do you really need this data? Does a department within your organization need this data or can it be confined to a particular area? Um, if not, then you know, just keep it. Um, in terms of data that's retained, simple stuff, record where it came from, what consents are in place for processing, who it's been shared with, either within your organization or if people consent, outside that organization. Again, is there a legal basis for retaining it? Is there a legal basis for the data being in the place within your organization that it is? Um, if you get audited, this stuff's great because obviously, you know, the ICO, they're not, they're not nasty people. If you've got policies and procedures in place, if you're really trying, um, they're likely to be pretty sympathetic. If you're using subcontractors or subsidiaries to process personal data, um, put data processing agreements in place to ensure everybody, them included, um, have appropriate security and decision-making mechanisms on the use of that data. Um, basically, you're responsible for everyone in your supply chain. So if you've got those kind of things, you can say, you know what, at least we tried our best. Implement training for all staff, obviously. Put confidentiality provisions and codes of conduct in both employees and consultants' contracts in staff handbooks. Set up data use and data breach policies. Not just train people, but sort of make it really, this is one of your obligations if you're working for us to know about this stuff. Um, and the big thing is here, really, is, is, is not law, actually. It's IT. It's, you know, if you, had, if you had an individual that needed to oversee and run this whole process, it just wouldn't work. You know, they, they'd go mad in seconds. This is um, work with IT departments for good online organization of data, regular internal audits, um, you know, security on which departments can access data, particularly very sensitive stuff, you know, if you're holding medical records, data on children, that kind of stuff. You don't want that on the central company server. It has to be protected with access only by people that really know what they're doing and really have to have access to it.